We all know that you can't believe everything you read, but at the same time, most journalists do try their level best to get the facts straight. It requires checking, and wherever possible, a first-hand account of what's happening. But an eyewitness account is not always possible, particularly in nasty wars on the other side of the world. And so reporters sometimes have to rely on other people's accounts. The story then becomes as good as its source, and sources sometimes lie. lie. The U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, deals in information and misinformation. Tonight we see how the CIA has been able to plant news reports that aren't just inaccurate, but totally fabricated. This is Angola, a former Portuguese colony in southwest Africa that's been at war since the mid-70s. Its left-wing government, supported by Cuban soldiers, fights a continual battle against guerrillas backed by South Africa. Ten years ago, the Soviets helped send guns and troops here, and the United States responded with support for the guerrillas. According to newspapers at the time, that's how the Angolan War started. But did it? John Stockwell, wearing the cross, worked for the CIA for 12 years. As a colonel, his last assignment was to run the U.S. campaign. The basic theme was to make it look like a, a Russian and Cuban aggression in Angola. And so any kind of story that you could write and get into the media anywhere that, that pushed that line, you did. Uh, one third of my staff in this task force was covert action, was propagandist. His professional career jobs was making up stories and finding ways to get them into the press. In 1975, the resource-rich African country was being fought over by three factions. Agostino Neto led the left-wing MPLA, which eventually became the government. Jonas Savin, an anti-Marxist, led UNITA, which was openly supported by South Africa. And another anti-communist force was led by Holden Roberta, who had been paid by the CIA for 14 years and was now to receive major U.S. support. The CIA had just closed down three long-term paramilitary operations in Southeast Asia. Uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, they had over a thousand paramilitary case officers come flocking back to Washington. They didn't have desks for everybody, much less jobs, and morale was rock bottom. They wanted a covert action, they wanted a paramilitary encounter. The rationale was that uh, the Soviet Union was trying to take advantage of the United States' weakness right after the, the Vietnam War, that Angola was getting its independence, and they were trying to snap it up, and that Henry Kissinger had decided that we could not be weak and we wouldn't let them do it. Our own files disproved that. We moved into Angola first, and Russians were responding to us. But before the CIA could move, the U.S. National Security Council had to be sold, and Stockwell helped with the briefing. The first briefings on Angola literally meant, gentlemen, this is a map of Africa. Here is Angola. And then they went on with a chart to explain there are three liberation movements in Angola. One of them is headed by Holden Roberto. He's the good guy. We've worked with him for years, and he's literally good guy. Then the, the MPLA is headed by this drunken, psychotic Marxist poet, Augustino Neto. He's the bad guy. And they used exactly the good so to make sure that people understood. <laughs> Once the National Security Council had given its blessing, Stockwell and the CIA cranked up their propaganda machine. And the newspapers around the world became unwitting accomplices in the campaign. From the CIA's headquarters, Stockwell sent his propagandists to Britain, Portugal, Zambia, and Zaire. Far from the battlefield in Angola, they wrote news releases for the two Western-backed factions, and these were fed into the ticker tapes of the Western media. Stockwell's CIA men also wined and dined Western journalists and gave them personal briefings. His man in Zambia was particularly enthusiastic. He ran a story that the city of Malangi had been captured by the UNITA forces, and in doing so, it captured 20 Russian advisors and uh, they thought this would show that Russians were running the thing in Angola. There weren't Russian advisors. It wasn't a factor, and we knew that. But the story did well. The Toronto Star, like many newspapers, picked it up from Reuters news agency. It was also carried in the Montreal Gazette and in the Vancouver Sun. I, I remember reporting that very clearly. Fred Berglund was the Reuters reporter who filed the story from Zambia. So, um, years later, I discovered that um, a little CIA um, misinformation expert had sat in the um, U.S. Embassy in Osaka and had composed that communique, and it bore absolutely no relationship at all to truth. You've got to remember, at that stage, during a war, um, you're working under incredible pressure. I, I worked for four months without a day off for 16 hours a day, and all that was wanted was a flow of information. I mean, I, I'd done the same in the Middle East War. I, I was based in Damascus, and in the first week of the war in Damascus, I, I wiped out the Israeli Air Force three times over, with official statements. Reuters, with its headquarters here on London's Fleet Street, is one of the world's largest news agencies. Its international bureaus provide many newspapers with their only source of news from far parts of the globe. Well, I mean, with hindsight, um, some of the official statements from the side I was reporting, and I stress from the side I was reporting, but also from the side that people in, um, in Luanda with the MPLA reported, clearly most of those, those statements were completely false. 